All right, thanks everybody again for joining us. Uh, I'd like to take this moment uh, to introduce Wysis Arjun Sangha, who will be giving some opening remarks. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you, Jennifer. Welcome to the Innovation in Dairy, the third entry into the Wysis Spark Symposium virtual series. This series, which fills the void of Wysis's annual in-person summer symposium, honors exciting research, innovation, and entrepreneurship taking place throughout the University of Wisconsin system. As Jennifer mentioned, I'm Arjun Sangha, the president of WISIS, an independent nonprofit organization that serves faculty, staff, students, and alumni of the 11 regional UW comprehensive campuses. At WISIS, we support research, we market ideas, we inspire students, and we build culture, all with the goal of inspiring Wisconsin innovation and that's why we've worked with the Dairy Innovation Hub, UW-Madison, UW-Platteville, and UW-River Falls to offer today's important conversation about the future of Wisconsin's $46 billion dairy industry. A recent independent study out of SMU ranked our 11 regional comprehensive institutions, along with WISIS, as number two in the nation in innovation impact productivity among small research universities. This is where and how it starts, with our talented and innovative researchers in collaboration with our industry partners and state leaders. We believe that putting talented people together from across the UW system can have a big and innovative impact on the dairy industry in our state. We hope today's event will start a conversation and inspire you to connect and collaborate across organizations and universities. One of our steadfast partners in innovation is the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, or WARF, which serves UW-Madison in the same way that WISIS serves UW-Platteville, UW-River Falls, and nine other regional UW system schools. I'd like to welcome a colleague and good friend, the CEO of WARF, Eric Iverson, to say a few words before we start today's exciting conversation. Eric? Thank you, Arjun. Um, really appreciate those um, just excellent opening remarks and kind words. Very much appreciate it. And um, I echo the close partnership between Wharf and Wysis and our and our good friend, our good friendship. Um, as Arjun noted, um, I'm CEO of Wharf. Wharf is the technology transfer office for the University of Wisconsin Madison. Our role is to patent uh, the new inventions coming off of campus and work with industry and startup companies to get those innovations developed into products and into the marketplace. And we've been doing that for about 95 years now. Uh, and it's interesting to note that the very first innovation off of the University of Wisconsin Madison's campus that was patented by Wharf and in fact gave life to Wharf was a dairy innovation. That was Dr. Steenbach's uh, um, enrichment of dairy products with vitamin D. So we are very near and dear to this, um, this industry. Um, all of us on this event, uh, farmers, researchers, folks from industry, know that uh, the agriculture is not just our past, but it's our present and our future. But constant innovation is needed in order for Wisconsin to maintain its global leadership position within the dairy industry and agriculture generally. For example, the work of Denise Ney, um, UW Madison inventor and friend of Wharf, and Wharf is very proud to be supporting her work. Uh, in developing better foods for vulnerable patients and, and other consumers. We'll learn from Denise and other panelists that the Dairy Innovation Hub is tackling some of the biggest challenges, including better stewardship of land and water resources, enriching human health and nutrition, ensuring animal health and welfare, and growing farm businesses and communities. These big challenges call for very big ideas. And I hope this virtual event will catalyze and energize and inform new alliances to take on those big ideas and bring life to them. Again, I, many thanks to Arjun and to all the folks at WISIS for making this virtual event possible. Um, I'm just so very pleased to see the collaboration and work among the various, various University of Wisconsin system schools, Platteville, River Falls, and Madison. Arjun and I talk often about how we can help build relationships among the campuses. I'm so excited by this one. Um, I'm now gonna turn it over to Dr. Heather White. She's Associate Professor of UW-Madison's Department of Animal and Dairy Science. Her uh, research focuses on the health and nutrition of dairy cows during the transition period. 
In uh, 2019, Heather was named faculty director of the Dairy Innovation Hub. Heather? Thank you, Eric and Arjun, for the opening comments. And I'd like to echo the gratitude for having us here today as a part of this virtual event. I think these are an excellent way to continue collaborating and discussion, uh, even within a virtual format. So as you just heard introduced, the Dairy Innovation Hub is an investment of the state of Wisconsin into research and innovation in dairy related challenges and questions that we need to continue being competitive. This $7.8 million investment within the dairy community is across UW-Madison, UW-Platteville, and River Falls. And we're very excited to be undertaking the collaborative efforts across these three campuses in research, instruction, and in outreach. Excitingly, for all of those of us involved, the priority focus of the Dairy Innovation Hub is not simply about cow biology or any other one aspect of the dairy world. Rather, it's about all of the aspects that intertwine to influence our dairy community and the strength that that brings to the state of Wisconsin. As shown here and as Eric mentioned, some of these priority areas are stewarding land and water resources, something that we know is ever more important in the state of Wisconsin from year to year. Growing farm businesses and communities is such an important part to our infrastructure in an area where research and innovation can certainly help our Wisconsin farmers, cheesemakers, and the rural communities that are built upon those networks. Enhancing human health and nutrition is an area that we're very excited to be doing research in, and you'll hear some of that work featured today. And the final priority area is animal health and welfare. Certainly an area near and dear to my research heart, but also an area that we have strengths at across the three campuses. Now the structure of the Dairy Innovation Hub is one that fosters collaboration by design. Sorry, can you go back one slide there? Thank you. So within the center of this diagram, you'll notice the leadership, commit, the leadership committee. The deans of the respective colleges of these three campuses are working together and interacting on a regular basis in order to facilitate the work across the three. Back one slide, please. But beyond just, beyond just working together through the campuses at the leadership level, each of the campuses has relevant steering committees that bring together faculty across the departments that are involved and can reach outside of that college to recruit in other faculty and staff, researchers and students. We also have constant connection with our stakeholders across the state with a formal advisory council group that gives us feedback in an ongoing fashion, as well as more informal opportunities such as today and other opportunities that I'll mention later uh, at the close of our, of our event. If you could go to the next slide, please. The collaborative and synergistic efforts across the campuses is one that's notably very valuable. We've learned through the decades that research done across disciplines and across perspectives is better for that. So we do better things together. We have greater innovation and research findings when we collaborate, especially across disciplines. So while each of these three campuses are contributing to the overall hub vision and goals, they're all doing it in a slightly different way. And again, you'll see this featured by the speakers today that represent different campuses. We have our own strengths and our own critical masses across the campuses and different facilities. And so while we can address these overall goals in our own individual, in our own individual ways, we can also have synergistic and additive effects by working together across the campuses. And we've already seen stimulation of this with researchers across campuses working together. The other aspect of collaboration that we're facilitating is that with researchers outside of the colleges directly involved, with companies across the state that are involved in innovation related to dairy, and with other campuses, universities, and entities all ways that you can get involved and contribute to the additive benefits of the research. Next slide, please. 
So as we think about how to have innovation within Wisconsin and within dairy, there's two things that we've really focused on. The first is short-term victories. There's no doubt there are some pressing questions that need answers right now. And some of our focus has been on projects and investments that will lead to that. Research faculty fellowships, especially at Platteville and River Falls, as well as capital equipment grants at all three campuses are allowing us to answer questions that we already have people to work on if we can only allow them to dedicate their time and expertise to do that. We've invested in postdoc research fellowships, which are those newly minted PhD researchers that can focus very specifically on a question at hand. And at Madison, we had short term high impact research projects, which are funded proposals that would yield results in one to two year periods, answering either questions highlighted by the Dairy Task Force 2.0 or other pressing and emerging questions. We've focused all of this and balanced it out with our strive to reach long term vision. Some questions will need more time to get at, as is the case with a lot of research. Our long term vision involves bringing in graduate students to build up areas of research to dedicate research support staff to increasing capacity for research across the three campuses and bringing in research and teaching faculty, a process that many of us know well takes time to invest in them coming to the campuses and developing their research programs. All of these together are contributing to a balance of both short term victories and long term vision across the four priority areas. You'll get to hear some of the projects funded under these various calls today. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer, who will introduce our breakout sessions. Thanks very much, Heather. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, I'm Jennifer Souter, Director of Patents and Licensing here at WISIS. And it has really been my pleasure to work in partnership with colleagues from the Dairy Innovation Hub to present today's event. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to quickly thank and acknowledge a few people who have made today possible. Uh, from WISIS, I would like to thank my colleague, Deborah Lundin, WISIS's pre-award manager of sponsored programs. Uh, Deborah's behind the scenes today, managing the logistics of Zoom, but has been really instrumental in the development of this program and getting us to where we are today. So thank you so much, Deborah. I'd also like to thank Sarah Kunkel from our office for all of her logistical administrative support and also our WISIS team members who are here as, as facilitators today uh, during the breakouts. Um, I'd also like to thank Maria Walt from the Hub for working with Deborah and I on the planning of this event and also helping make today a success. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank all of the Hub moderators and presenters uh, who are with us today. And in just a few moments, each presenter will be introduced and queued to start their presentation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, to get the most out of your viewing experience, if you're not already, we encourage you to use speaker view and ask that you again leave your audio and video turned off during the main presentations. Um, as we have a full schedule today, we will not be taking Q&A after each presentation. Rather, you're encouraged to engage in, with the presenters uh, in the dedicated breakout sessions, which will directly follow the main session. Uh, each breakout session will be moderated by a hub funded, uh, excuse me, a hub representative, as well as a WISIS team member. And these breakout sessions are really aimed to provide an opportunity for you to engage uh, in collaborative discussion with others in the room, as well as provide that opportunity for Q&A with the presenters today. Uh, so today you're going to be hearing from six researchers that represent really a diverse cross section of hub funded research, some of which have already resulted in patentable technologies uh, being pursued by both WISIS and WARF. Uh, we look forward to seeing more of the innovations to come. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. So please welcome Jill Coleman Wasik from UW River Falls. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so uh, it's really exciting to be with you this morning. Thank you for inviting me um, to participate in this in this wonderful event. Um, my research is looking at um, solutions, finding solutions to uh, groundwater contamination in agricultural communities. And um, I have a research fellowship funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub, but this work really grows out of a collaboration with the Western Wisconsin Conservation Council, which is a relatively new um, 
a farmer-led watershed council formed in St. Croix, Pierce, and Southern Polk counties on the western side of the state. So um, next slide, please. So nitrate contamination, um, I'm, my research is going to look a little more broadly at groundwater contamination, but the, but the focus lies with nitrate. So if we look across um, the state of Wisconsin, you see in the upper left hand corner of this slide, nitrate is really elevated in groundwater across the agricultural areas of the state. And this is the story across the nation as well. Um, about 90% of the, the nitrate contamination in Wisconsin is coming from agricultural activities. What we do on the landscape affects what's, what's in our groundwater below. So, uh, my focus is kind of the western Wisconsin area. You see that circled. Um, in our region, we see relatively elevated levels of nitrate in many wells. Um, this map is from the um, great tool by the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, their well water quality viewer. And you can see the, the, the warmer the colors, the more elevated the nitrate concentrations. Um, so in Pierce County, where you know our average nitrate concentrations are starting to creep up towards that health standard, which is 10 parts per million nitrate, um, and that health standard is protective of the most vulnerable in our population, so um, infants and as well as pregnant mothers and their their growing fetuses. So. Um, Elevated nitrate in the body can cause a variety of problems. Um, nitrate interacts with um, the hemoglobin in the blood and can cause suffocation in infants. Um, but there's also evidence that nitrate in the body can also lead to perhaps colorectal cancers. There's a lot of research going on right now to kind of ascertain what the what all of the effects are of chronic nitrate exposure. So um, I've been working with the the Western Wisconsin Conservation Council for the last couple years and um, they came to me actually in our, our department looking for help to study this nitrate issue in groundwater in our region which I think is a really uh, important part of my research it's the farmers that came and asked these questions themselves and I think that these folks have been somewhat left out of the well testing programs that you see represented in the, the well water quality viewer. So um, just below the map on the lower left hand side, you see some of the data that we've generated. And what we're finding is that on average, um, we're looking at about 60 wells um, for the, the members in the Western Wisconsin Conservation Council. And about 35 of those wells have nitrate concentrations that fall above the health standard. And that's the average. So we do seasonal sampling of these wells and the, the averages are above the health standard. So this is really of concern and, and I'm not sure that it's um, that this is a group that's really showing up in the data that we have represented. Uh, so one of the one of the questions that we're trying to, to answer in, in my research is to, to try and figure out well where is the nitrate coming from um, and especially for the 12 percent of wells in our data set where we see nitrate concentrations that are more than two times the health standard how variable are those concentrations what is the time frame of that variability because we know concentrations can go up and down over time um, and can we you know can we can we do something about this so that that folks can feel safe drinking their water um, my research is going to focus on using lysimeters, which are just basically little soil water wells um, that installed in fields. We ran a pilot study last summer where we installed um, these little kind of soil water samplers at two feet below the soil surface and four feet below the soil surface in alfalfa, conventional corn, and uh, no-till soybeans. And that's the figure that you're seeing in the upper right hand side. And we saw just in this little pilot study, we saw some pretty big differences based on, you know, different land use practices, cropping practices. And so my research is going to dive in a little bit more because again, what we do on the landscape, um, it, it affects what's going on in, in the subsurface below and affects the, the water quality. So really, I, I hope to help to narrow in on finding which practices are most effective at reducing uh, nutrient leaching in a, our particular area and over what time frame those might work. Great, thank you so much, Jill. All right, next up we have Stephen Deller from UW-Madison. 
Stephen? Good morning, everyone. Um, one of the things that came out of the Dairy Task Force 2.0 was that we need to better educate uh, community members, uh, non-farming community members about how dairy contributes to the local economy. And when I heard that recommendation, I thought that, um, you know, we have a lot of that information. Next slide, please. We have a lot of that information um, in that we do, uh, every five years, we update the uh, study that's, that's referred to as the contribution of agriculture to the state's economy. And part of that is a detailed assessment of how dairy uh, contributes to the local economy. So I took that recommendation and thought, well, maybe we're not doing a very good job of, of conveying the information that's coming out of that report. And one of the things that has come forward um, as I work with communities on this issue is that when we try to provide uh, detailed information about how dairy farms, cheese processing plant, and other dairy processing plants uh, contribute to the local economy, we can provide fairly detailed information on uh, the input supply chains. What are farmers buying in the local economy to operate their farms? What are farmers uh, spending in terms of uh, residents of the local community? How are they spending their money in the local economy? The problem that we're finding is that we can produce extremely detailed tables of lots and lots and lots of numbers. The problem though, is that uh, most folks eyes glaze over when you present um, that a, t a bunch of tables with a lot of really detailed numbers. So what we were thinking with this particular project is that we need to come up with a way to better visualize this information. So the idea here really is to kind of look at how do dairy farms spend their money. Now they can spend their money in two places. One is they can spend it in the local economy, uh, the local community, or they import from outside. Now, what we have here is a, an example of what a visualization might look like. This is for the state of Wisconsin. Dairy farms spend uh, most of their money on feed. Uh, particularly $882 million is spent on feed from suppliers in the state of Wisconsin. Those feed farmers need to actually then operate. They need to uh, make purchases. So you can see how there's this kind of ripple effect that's going through. Far, farmers also spend a lot of money on real estate. A lot of that's rental. A lot of dairy farmers rent the land that they operate or a, a portion of the land that they operate. So that's money going into one part of the economy. Now the real estate program, they actually end up spending a fair amount of money on labor. Uh, that's money going to the actual folks that are um, kind of running the business, if you will. They take that money and they spend that in the local economy. But for the state of Wisconsin, dairy farms import about $1.5 billion from outside of the state. So the strategy here is how do we, one, convey this information so that local folks better understand how dairy is connected to the local economy through a visualization as opposed to a table of number after table of numbers. And then also look at these imports. We can actually go down and look at fairly detailed levels of what is being imported. Now, from an economic development perspective, those imports are a lost opportunity for the local economy. What we want to try to do is identify areas where we can tighten up those connections. We can essentially minimize the amount that's being imported into the community and is actually being purchased in the local community. We can identify business opportunities um, and we can identify ways in which we can tighten up those, those contributions. Now, the questions that we have with this work is how do we best visualize these connections? It is possible to get into so much detail here that it can become overwhelming. The tables are overwhelming, but 
can we come up with a way to visualize this so that it's intuitive and people can better understand these connections? Can such a visualization help local communities better understand how dairy impacts their communities? Are these visualizations actually a better way of conveying information than a series of tables? We kind of know that this a bunch of tables of numbers really is not doing it. That's why the task force came up with this one recommendation. It's not really hitting the goals that we thought it had been. How detailed should these visualizations be? This is just the top three industries that the dairy, um, dairy farms in the state of Wisconsin purchase. If I were to put all of these connections on here, there would be something like um, 55 different industries then each one of those 55 different industries has their own connections. Very easily, this thing can become overwhelming. How detailed should that visualization be? The other is that if we can do this for dairy farming, and it works, we can expand it out for other sectors. We can look at how, say, a project I'm working on is with the rural hospitals, for example. How do rural hospitals contribute to the local economy? So if we can learn from the, the dairy experience here, we can expand our understanding of other sectors in the economy. So this is really kind of a, um, a way to help expand our way of thinking and presenting economic information to the residents of Wisconsin and the policymakers. And uh, we hope to be able to get this down so that we can do it for individual counties uh, across the state of Wisconsin. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Stephen. That's wonderful. Um, all right, our next presenter is uh, Sylvia Kehoe from UW River Falls. Sylvia? Hey, hi everyone. Thanks for, for attending. So my, my research is, uh, the, our objective is very simple. And that's, um, I'm a professor of dairy science at UW River Falls, and I do a lot of research with undergraduates. And I also um, am the coach for the Dairy Challenge team, which means that I get to visit a lot of farms across the US. We go all over to the East Coast, to the West Coast, around the Midwest. And one of the things that I noticed when I was out at some of these farms is that a lot of farmers are using a new method, newer, <laughs> it's not new, but it's newer, more popular right now, um, to uh, take the horn tissue off of calves so that they don't grow horns. It's called caustic paste or pasting and it's becoming very popular. And the, the thing that my students and I noticed is that on, a, on some of these farms that um, the method that the farmers are using seems to be very inconsistent and it seems to potentially be a little bit um, harmful to the calf where they just, uh, they get more tissue taken off than they need to. So our objective, my students and I that we developed was um, very simple, is to develop a, a new way or a more consistent way to apply this disbudding paste to calves. Next slide, please. So it's, it's uh, very simple. Um, I'm working with a colleague at UW Platteville and I've also got um, some stakeholder interest with one of the pasting companies to try and develop this applicator that would make this method more consistent. And so um, one of the things that would affect obviously is the health of the calf and the safety for the calf, but also the safety for the, the employees that are putting this paste on. So currently um, there's two main methods that, that farmers use to disbud calves and we say disbud instead of dehorn because in the first two months of life the horn tissue isn't connected to the skull and so we, it's disbudding. Um, dehorning is later on after the two months of life where the horn tissue connects to the skull of the calf. It's more invasive and it's a, a tougher process to do. So we want to make sure that farmers are doing it as early as possible and so um, about 16% of farmers are using pasting methods. So it's not a huge amount, but we have seen that the interest is growing quite rapidly in the dairy community. And that's because it's, it seems to be an easier way of taking that horn tissue off of disputting the calf. 
Um, the, and again, the problem is, is that because it's kind of a newer method, not really, but in, in the dairy community it is, um, some of the, some employees are a little bit more uncomfortable with it. And if you, if you read the directions on the, on the paste, there's not a whole lot of directions that are given. And so it's, it's kind of a method that an employee might develop for themselves. And so, and that potentially could be a little bit incorrect. And so, um, so the, the process is very simple. We, we give the calf an analgesic, so that's typically in the milk, and then we clip the hair a, a little bit, and then we take this, ideally this preloaded applicator, and just put it on the calf. And it stays on the calf for as long as the calf um, keeps it on, which typically is, is the allotted amount that it needs to work, and then, and that's it. And so um, it sounds like a simple process, and, and hopefully it will be, but we're working on this applicator and how to make it um, most user-friendly and, again, just a most con more consistent protocol for the employees to be able to do. So um, currently I have, uh, I did have an undergraduate working on this and we plan to resume again in the fall. So uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Sylvia. That's really great. Uh, I'd like to welcome our next speaker from UW-Madison, Denise Ney. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to have a grant from the Dairy Innovation Hub to further my research on the health benefits of a unique protein isolated from sweet cheese whey called glycomacropeptide, or GMP. With support from WARF, the Wisconsin Center for Dairy Research, NIH, FDA, and private donors, I've been studying the health benefits of this protein for over 15 years. GMP is a 64 amino acid prebiotic peptide found in milk within the kappa casein micelle. We cannot isolate GMP from milk. We rely on the cheese making process, which frees the GMP from the casein into the whey fraction, where GMP comprises 15 to 20% of whey protein. My GMP research story began with a call from professor of food science, Mark Etzel, who told me he had a new method to isolate high purity GMP from cheese whey. He also mentioned that GMP is the only known dietary protein that does not contain the essential amino acid phenylalanine. Individuals with a genetic disease, phenylketonuria or PKU, need to follow a lifelong low phenylalanine diet to prevent brain damage and severe cognitive imp impairment. Since the 1960s, all babies born in the United States are screened before they, for PKU before they leave the hospital so that if they have it, they can immediately start on the low phenylalanine diet to protect their brain. After studies, in mice and humans with PKU, we succeeded in developing GMP medical foods. These specialized foods were commercialized via a wharf patent that was licensed to Canbrick Foods, a family-owned company named after their children, both of whom have PKU, Cameron and Brooklyn. This research with the com commercialization that wharf provided this research with GMP has resulted in improved nutrition and quality of life for families living with PKU around the world. Along the way with our PKU research, we had unexpected findings. That is, control or wild type mice fed the GMP diet, especially the female control mice. These mice had less body fat and inflammation and bigger and stronger bones compared to the wild type control mice fed the casein diet. Studies in humans from our research group and other groups around the world have also shown that people are less hungry after eating GMP compared to other dietary proteins. Next slide. Additional human research is needed to determine if GMP 
protein supplement would reduce hunger hormones, making it easier to lose weight, promote bone health, and improve the gut microbiota and reduce inflammation. With Dairy Hub funding, we will evaluate the effects of a powdered GMP supplement that is mixed with water and provides 25 grams of protein and 130 calories per serving. This supplement was developed for our research by AgroPer, a Wisconsin company. Our study will include 10 healthy, overweight postmenopausal women who will drink the GMP supplement at home two or three times a day before meals. They will also keep food records and make five visits over one month to the clinical research unit located at UW Hospital in Madison. Our research volunteers will receive free protein supplements and earn up to $825. We hope to start our GMP hunger study this September. WARF is in discussions with potential commercial partners to isolate a patent associated with this GMP dietary supplement that we are studying. In conclusion, dairy products are rich in essential nutrients needed to optimize health across the life cycle. Americans, however, are unlikely to drink more cow's milk. My vision for innovative dairy research is to investigate dairy components such as GMP, but there are many others that we can, we can study further, and to see if these dairy can, components can be incorporated into diets for specific health needs. In other words, personalized nutrition with dairy products. Thank you. Thanks very much, Denise, that's great. All right, our next speaker is Claudine Pie from UW Platteville. Claudine. Hi, uh, my name is Claudine Pie, and I teach anthropology and sociology, and I'm working on this project with Shan Sappleton, who's a professor of, of political science there as well. Uh, and so our project is about changing agricultural land. Um, and I could start by taking a look at the pictures in the background of this slide. These came up when I Googled Wisconsin landscape, and I just wanted to point that out to start uh, just to be able to recognize the significance of agriculture for the identity and for the landscape of Wisconsin. So the problem that we are addressing related to changing agricultural land is both the consolidation and the loss of agricultural land. So with the consolidation, we can see the connection to the increase in dairy herd size uh, throughout Wisconsin. And, and the loss of agricultural land, we can see, for example, that between 2014 and 2018, about 24,000 acres of agricultural land was sold and diverted to other uses, which, with the total decline in agricultural land being much higher. So the current economic crisis and farm bankruptcies also has the potential to exacerbate these changes. And thinking about the relations, some of the practical relationships to the dairy industry, um, these land changes can affect land availability for pasturing, but also farmers' availability to derive income from haying, supplemental commodities, leasing land. It can also affect the land available for new farmers um, and as I mentioned, the change in Wisconsin's landscape. The goals of this research, we have three major goals. The first is to document the impacts of all of these changes on dairy farmers and on the surrounding rural and suburban communities, particularly focusing on how farmers and community members themselves described the effects of these changes on their families and their communities. Um, and secondly, we're going to investigate uh, people's reactions some of, to some existing policies like farmland preservation programs or farm easements um, and ask and get information about uh, potential other policies so that we can make land-based policy recommendations. And the third major goal of the, this research is to uh, involve students in the research and increase student understanding of land ownership and its relationship to the dairy industry and to healthy communities. Um, and in so doing, build stronger connections between agriculture and social science. 
so methodologically, how we're going to study this, we're going to focus on Dane and Grant counties. Uh, with Dane County especially having more of the issue of agricultural land loss and Grant County with consolidation. So we're going to be able to look at the, some of the differences in those two contexts. And in the first phase, which we're currently in, we're starting to collect uh, demographic data, land use data, so that we'll have that to then um, compare to our findings in phases two and three of the project, and which we will be doing interviews and participant observation with dairy farmers, uh, but also other community members, uh, especially those tied into the agricultural or dairy industry. Um, and we will then in the third phase in the second year, uh, try to see how generalizable some of the findings of that qualitative research are, is, uh, how generalizable the findings are by doing a survey. Um, and throughout all of this, we're going to be involved with uh, student recruitment and training um, because a lot of the students we'll be working with may not have a background in agriculture or they may not have a background in social science and they may have a background in agriculture. So we're going to want to make sure that they are up to speed on both uh, disciplinary perspectives. And finally, the importance of the research. Um, there's been a lot of recognition of, of the negative effects of agricultural land loss. We especially want to focus on this on, on how it is affecting our communities in Wisconsin um, and the specific connections to the dairy industry. And in so doing, we hope we will draw attention to the significance of the dairy industry, not only for the uh, strength of the economy in Wisconsin, but also for our social connections, our identity, um, our vision of landscape, um, and just the health of our communities in general. Um, and finally, we want to be sure to include the voices and experiences of dairy farmers and other community members in shaping policy. So we think this is important, uh, not only because it creates stronger policy, but also because we can have more buy-in when uh, policies are not directed from top down, but people feel like they've been involved in the decision-making process. Uh, thank you. That's great. Uh, thanks so much, Claudine. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Joseph Wu and John Obligadon from UW Platteville. John, Joseph. Hello, is Joseph there? Okay. Uh, I I forgot to I forgot to unmute. Sorry. Hi everyone. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um. Thank you for providing us opportunity to share with our project, and this is an interdisciplinary project between Mechanical Engineering Department and Chemistry Department at UW Platteville. This is a, a interdisciplinary project. And our title is Development of Milk Protein Based 3D Printing Biocomposite Using Spoiled Milk and Whey from Dairy Processing Waste. It's a long title, but uh, our goal is uh, very short and clear. We basically want to expand the dairy product using milk protein for 3D printing application. So instead of looking at milk as a source of food, we actually look at milk as a source of material. So in this slide, you can see there are two shelves in this slide. And one shelf is a, a, a shelf that contains lots of milk, which is very common, uh, our grocery experience. Our, our vision is using our project, we can expand that milk product, now create a shelf of uh, filament, which you see on your, on your right, which, which have many different kinds of filament with different color, different property. So we are basically trying to turn this milk, uh, especially milk protein, into a 3D printing application. So 
why are we looking at the milk protein? In fact, milk protein, if you look at chemistry level, uh, if you see the picture on, at the center of the slide, there are two pictures. On the top is a polypeptide. It's basically if you break the protein into a, a chain of uh, a protein chain, that, that is a polypeptide. And you can, uh, I highlight the functional group in that protein, let's call MI bonds. And if you look at the commercially available nylon 66, which is the image below, you can see there's a similarity uh, where there's a, a MI uh, bond in, in the nylon material. So, so by looking at chemistry, you can see this material from protein can be very strong. And we actually demonstrate that uh, on picture on the uh, right lower corner is the film, is the actual polymer that we actually make from casing. And it's very strong material. We try to break, break it apart with our hand, try to pull it apart. It's very difficult to pull it apart. And it's transparent, uh, it's brittle. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of brittle material. So we are actually working with this, see if we can actually uh, use for 3D printing. Uh, one note that I have to say is that the milk that we want to use is not the fresh milk, uh, not competing with the food source. It has to be either spoiled milk or milk that was going to be thrown away or unsold milk, or could be bacteria contaminated milk because they all contain the same protein. If we can harvest the protein, instead of them throwing it away to decompose in the environment, create uh, environmental issues, we can actually use those to create the polymer. And I'll let uh, Dr. Opio down to talk further uh, about our motivation and also overall process. Dr. Opio, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you please go to the next uh, slide? Well, you can see on the top uh, left slide, an image of uh, somebody dumping milk. That's, that image is somehow concerning uh, to us where we got the information about the amount of uh, milk that is dumped annually. In 2016, as an example, we understand from records that over 43 million gallons of milk was dumped. And that was a, a year when there was no major crisis nationally or internationally. Uh, this year from records also, we had that in Wisconsin, at some, at some point there were over 30,000 gallons of milk that were dumped because of the corona, coronavirus uh, problem. So what we, what we are doing uh, is to use this economic waste to, to, to turn around the, the usefulness of proteins in milk uh, specifically casein and uh, whey, uh, for the purpose of creating polymer, as Joseph, my colleague, has said. And the target application is for, three, for developing printable materials for 3D printing industry. Uh, the background of this research uh, is in the project that we have been uh, working on for some years now. We have developed a 3D printing material for for different applications using lignin, which is biodegradable material, biorenewable material. And uh, we are looking into different ways to use uh, casein and whey in this project. And uh, we are not just looking at filament alone in this case. We are at this time open-minded to different 3D printing processes. There are so many processes. There is the extrusion-based process, and there is the, and there is the and there is the powder-based processes. There are the uh, VAT photopolymerization processes. So we will develop using characterizations uh, materials that are printable in any of this route of, of, of processes. And our goal is to be able to produce uh, useful materials that will be competitive to, with the uh, synthetic materials from petroleum-based uh, sources. And we hope that uh, we'll be able to uh, make some transformation in the market sector of 3D printing with the, uh, with the products that we made 
using this uh, from this research. Thank you. So, uh, firstly, on behalf of YSIS, I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the event. I hope you had some great discussions in the breakout rooms. I want to thank all of our presenters again from the Hub Funded Researchers. Um, a great showcase of, of what some of the research that's being funded by the Hub was and how, you know, from disciplines from social sciences to engineering to ag to biochem to, to dairy. Uh, so really a, a great showcase of that. Um, we hope today's event will be the first of many innovation gatherings uh, to really support those conversations and catalyze new allowances, alliances around different topics in Wisconsin. So stay tuned uh, for, from WISIS for more information on additional events and programming uh, that we'll have in the future. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier and throughout, we are very happy to help facilitate connections. Uh, if you need to be connected to someone at the hub or you couldn't remember someone's name, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and we will definitely make those connections for you. Uh, so before we leave, I want to turn it over now to Heather White for a few closing remarks on behalf of the hub. So Heather. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you again. I'd like to echo what Jennifer said. Uh, great discussion today. It was a great opportunity to showcase some of the research and just give you an idea of what's going on. Deborah, I don't know if the slides are available for you to pull back up. That would be great. Um, so one of the things we want to mention are opportunities for collaboration and other ways that you could get involved. Um, Jennifer mentioned that they're happy to help connect if it's contact information you need. But a few other things just to keep in mind uh, for everyone, we'll be having an e-newsletter. E um, we are now on social media, Facebook and Twitter, and we have a website that is updated and linked to all three campuses specific websites as well. So if you're not tuned into those and you'd like to be, uh, just send us a note or let Jennifer or Deborah know and we can get you on those email lists. As I mentioned, it came up in discussion in one of the breakouts I was in, we're uh, really working towards collaborating across campuses and the colleges, but also with nonprofits and relevant groups. So if you are a member of one of those, or if you uh, know someone who's there and wants to get involved, we have opportunities for, for providing input from those, both through formal mechanisms like the advisory council I mentioned earlier, but also through opportunities like this and through Dairy Summit, uh, places where we're hoping to have really great open discussion um, about the research, the focus, and the dairy community in a broader aspect. For researchers across campuses, collaborate, apply for hub funding, share your ideas with us. If you have any questions, Maria Wolt, the program manager who helps across all three campuses, Myself, Tara, and Steve uh, are all available to, to help to answer questions and to facilitate collaboration. And then we've been reaching out actively to farmers and processors across the state. Uh, we've been gathering their input. What are the challenges and questions they have? Pairing them up with researchers that may have domain knowledge that they're, they're seeking out. And if you'll go to the next slide, we are very excited to be having the first annual Dairy Summit from the Dairy Innovation Hub scheduled for November 18th. True to the world we live in these days, it will be a virtual conference, but that also gives the opportunity for everyone to participate. We'll have the chance to hear other featured research. We'll have opportunities for panel discussions. Uh, and for town hall session type uh, discussions and brainstorming. So please get that on your calendar. Registration will start this fall. It will be a free event to attend this year given the virtual format. And we hope to get a lot of uh, good discussion and good feedback out of that. So thank you again to WISIS for having us uh, and for featuring dairy as a topic of their innovation series. And thank you all for participating. Have a great day. Thanks so much, Heather. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.